I was on day turn down the pit on the coal face when I got a message to phone the control room immediately. I bumped into a friend and jokingly I said to him, well, I've either been sacked or there's a death in the family. I said, no, nobody's ill, so there's no death. I said, so it must be the fact that I broke that machinery yesterday. I bumped into the training officer who informed me there'd been a gentleman at the pit looking for me. So I went home. There was a man waiting to see me. He broke the news about my son. We went in and the sister said to us, uh, you must understand uh, uh, that uh, Peter is very badly injured. We don't know how he managed to survive as long as he has. Uh, um, please don't get shocked at the state he's in. And um, then took us to his bedside. Uh, my wife held his hand and um, he gave a little squeeze of, uh, of her hand and, uh, and he passed away. It still affects us as much now as it did the first day we heard it. It's devastated the whole family. There's times when we're sat at home together and we just can't stop crying. We look at his photograph and tears come. Do you think your son's death had a purpose? I don't know. He was our only son. And we loved him. We loved him a lot. What feelings do you have about the people who took his life? Anger. Bitterness. Revenge. I think we've got to stop pussyfooting about over there and get on with Dead. getting rid of the IRA. The kid gloves have got to come off and the iron fist has got to come in. As the violence in Ulster has escalated sharply, we've talked to parents whose sons have been killed while serving in the army there. Understandably, they loathe the IRA. New hatreds are thus added to the many born from Ulster. Tonight, as the British government struggles with a deadlocked policy, we explore the options open to it. We also examine how, at a personal level, grief and loss have bred an anger that makes that deadlock more intractable. It's a process sometimes painful to watch, but part of the root of Ulster's troubles. Many of the bereaved are also trying to find a meaning that will make sense of their loss. Walter Green, a miner from St Helens, is one of them. Three months ago, he heard that his soldier son, Derek, had been killed in Ulster. I felt very proud of the fact that he decided to join the forces rather than just stay around home and try to get a job, because there's not many going in St Helens. But his mother didn't want him to go. They had quite a battle over it. But in the end, she gave him his blessing and he went down to Sutton Coalfield to apply for the job as a staff clerk in the RAOC. Walter Green still had questions about his son's death. To help answer them, last week he accepted an invitation from us to go to Ulster. It was his first visit. Welcome to Belfast, Mr Green. Thank you. I hope you've had a pleasant flight. Fine, thanks. I agreed to come to Northern Ireland. I wanted to see the place where my son and his five comrades was killed. Hopefully to meet some of the people who rendered assistance to them on the evening that they died. And then to talk to some of the politicians and to see why all these killings are taking place and to see if we can come up with some answers to stop the killings. My first impression of Northern Ireland 
it's not much difference to being at home on the mainland. The only time you realise you are out of England is the fact that the street signs are different. They point to Antrim, Belfast and various different places. The countryside itself is just the same as any countryside on the mainland. And then until you get back into Belfast, where you see the devastation caused by the bomb on the night that I arrived in Belfast, two beautiful buildings literally torn apart by the bomb that exploded. Green's son was killed by the IRA in June this year after taking part in a charity fun run in Lisbon. All of a sudden, the explosion went up. I realised there was something pretty awful had happened. And I looked down in this direction, and here I could see the uh, pall of smoke and the flames going up. And uh, I realised that there must have been one of these bombs that had uh, exploded under a car. And that's where... The, the, the actual explosion took place, and that's a mark that it has left indeed on the road there. Uh, Doctor, uh, we have been informed by the army, and I do believe what they've told me, that my son died outright. I'd like to know his, exactly that he did die outright. I saw the whole situation here, and I, I can reassure you that your son would have died absolutely instantaneously. I'm asking these questions not just for me and my wife, for the parents of two of the other young lads. Surely, yes. Who we have been to see, and they yes. want the same assurances yes. that yes. their sons didn't suffer. That's right. I've seen a lot of things happening in my time. I've been here 26 years, but I've never seen the like of this. Are you, oh, one, yes, of, are you one of the soldiers' fathers? I am, yes. And I'm very pleased to meet you. And you have our deepest sympathy in the people of Lisbon. Thank you very much. We've shed tears here, those lads. That is quite right. You said one of your reasons for coming here was to see the place your son was killed. You've seen it. What thoughts do you have? Walking around the marketplace, was all churned up inside. To think that a town that looks as beautiful as this one could have been a place where my son and his comrades died. It makes you so distressed. You just feel like crying. Looking around at the area, you wouldn't believe it had ever happened. Protestants in Ulster want the British Army to stay there and protect them. And most of them, like most Catholics, condemn violence. But Protestant paramilitaries represent a clear menace of unauthorised force. Marching with the paramilitaries here is the deputy leader of Ian Paisley's Democratic Unionist Party, Peter Robinson, on the left. Robinson has in the past refused to condemn attacks on Ulster's security forces by Protestant extremists. Yet he represents an important political force, and for Walter Green, some knowledge of the Unionist case was an essential starting point. Well, this must have been a very difficult day for you and a very difficult visit. Yes, it has been. You've been out to Lisburn. Yes, I've been to Lisburn. I think the terrible thing about it really is that in this kind of situation, uh, all that security uh, ends up being after a number of months is statistics. But behind every one of those statistics, there's a, a family uh, in anguish, uh, lives have been ruined. Yes, uh, my son loved Northern Ireland, Mr Robinson. He taught a great deal of the people over here. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to really appreciate the place. Robinson takes the opportunity to focus on the ruthlessness of the IRA while emphasising the peaceful side of unionism. Uh, the IRA aren't interested in anything other than destruction and getting their all-Ireland republic, uh, whether it's over the, the bodies of people in Northern Ireland or of soldiers coming from the, the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, so they're not going to, to give in. Uh, and I think we have to face up to the fact that terrorism has to be defeated. But alongside that and in parallel to that, uh, I think there has to be a political process uh, so that we can get structures that the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland can give their consent to. But the one man I really wanted to speak to was Mr Jerry Adams and he's refused point blank to talk to me. I had a few choice questions for that man. Why he won't meet me, I don't know. Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, refused to agree to a meeting between its president, Gerry Adams, and Walter Green. They argued that British politicians were not asked to meet relatives of dead IRA men. We sought out others who knew the Republican case. We're going to talk to now somebody who is the father of an IRA man who was killed. 
I'd like to say, like to hear what this man has got to say to me. His son was killed. My son was killed. They are completely different circumstances. So I'd really like to meet him to see what he has to say. Mr. Vincent Kelly's son, Patrick, was killed last year in an SAS ambush at Loch Gore. Mr. Kelly admits his son was a member of the IRA. Mr. Kelly, thank you. I understand you're over here on a visit to visit various people yes, to find out uh, what actually how it takes place here or why your son was killed. Yes. Uh, I can give you a fill in the background of my son who's also killed in this war that's taken place in the north of Ireland. My son Patrick was 30 years of age, married, a young wife, three young children, but chose to go out and fight for, for the freedom of this country. And that's how he met his death. Mr Kelly Britain isn't at war with Northern Ireland. Oh, Northern right. Ireland is a part of the mainland. The there are a million Protestants who wish to remain part of Great Britain. Why should just a few, same as your son, want to impose their will on others? But why, you, can't, you say a million Protestants, what about the rest of the people in Ireland? This is a 32 county Ireland. It, it, Britain come in and cut a slice off a country and says this is ours. No Irishman can accept this. Well, how would you feel if the same thing happened in your country, a slice of your country is taken off and said, right, this is a majority here wants to remain part of Ireland or whatever the case may be. But how would you feel about that or what would you do about it? There's no way would I take up a gun and go around killing innocent boys. Innocent boys? Who's the innocent boys? My son was innocent and his five comrades on the day they were murdered. They were trying to raise money for charity for here in Northern Ireland. But your son... My here. son wasn't armed. He didn't have a chance to fight back. Some skulking coward, and that's all as I can class him as, planted a bomb underneath his vehicle. Oh, your dear. son, when yeah. he was killed, was about to commit murder. Oh, no. Murder My of another Irishman. My son was fighting for the freedom of his country. You just can't say as, as Northern Ireland belongs to Britain. It's not even Northern Ireland. It's North East, east of Ireland. Let's see if we can't find some way of stopping it. You've lost a son and I've lost well, a son. Well, there's far How too many people have lost their sons. How many more sons have got to be lost? Well, it's, 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 the fault lies with the British government. The British government can solve this problem tomorrow morning by giving a declaration of intent to withdraw from our country. The future will be decided by Irish people and not be decided by British it will government. Be, and not it will be not be decided, by, decided by the gun and the bomb. Well, unfortunately, it's the only language that Britain ever understood. That's an unfortunate fact of it's the It's the only language that, Britain, that you, uh, that you want understand. to use. And I'm sorry, but there is just no way I can accept what's happening over here. Well, maybe if I had longer at it, or if I could meet you again sometime and have a good talk with you, maybe I'd get you around to think in the proper way. No, Mr Kelly, you would never get me to think anything else of what's happening over here. I can't understand If you could that. see my wife at home, the way she's suffering. No, no, what, what, about, the, what about our feelings when we see our son's been killed? My son was your killed, son, the only son I had. Yes. And a good lot. I repeat what I said before, that your son was about to commit murder My when son he was wasn't killed. about to kill him. My yeah. son was out trying to free his country. It was occupied by British forces. And he's out to try to do his bit to try and drive him out of the country. Mr Kelly, you have your ideas, I have mine. I can't convince you, and there's just no way will you ever convince me for the reason of my son's death. The only thing I can say to you is thank you very much for allowing me into your home and giving me some of your time. Thank you. Bye bye. The idea of pulling British troops out of Northern Ireland is not even being considered by the British government. Most soldiers, too, are against the idea. Major General Philip Davies served two tours in Ulster in the 1970s and later helped train troops who were going there. He left the British Army two years ago. I personally don't agree with that because if the British Army withdraws at a stroke from Ulster, then in my book the terrorist has won. And if one could perhaps make a little analogy, say with Scotland, now let us suppose that one had a group of terrorists operating, much as the IRA are doing, in Scotland. Would the British people rarely say to themselves, well, let's throw out the Act of Union, let's throw out the Act of Settlement, and let us allow terrorists to rule in Scotland? It just wouldn't be a starter, and I see no more reason for it being so in Ulster. The gunman has won in other parts of the world, and things still carry on much as before. But the gunman has never won in Great Britain. Walter Green shares the view that the United Kingdom cannot be divided up.
No, I believe that Northern Ireland is a part of Great Britain. We have a few friends that are Irish, and even though they were born here in Ireland, they know and believe that they are part of Great Britain, and they're really nice people to know. But some who have served in the British Army in Ulster are less sure of Britain's right to stay. Hugo Grenville was a Coldstream Guards captain who did a five-month tour there. I think the Catholics feel, rightly or wrongly, that for 400 years, the British have been intruders in their land. And the physical manifestation of that intrusion are the security forces. In particular, the British Army on the border, out on patrol, in green uniforms, carrying rifles. Do you think the IRA have got a case? No, I don't think the IRA have a case. But I think there is a very strong case for a united Ireland. Would this united Ireland have a British presence? No, it wouldn't. I think that we would have to establish the principle that uh, the British Army withdrew over a period of time. We would need to get everybody around the negotiating table. We would need to talk to the Irish government, to Sinn Féin, to the Loyalists, and perhaps the United Nations. But a British withdrawal from Northern Ireland is exactly what the IRA want. Of course they do. But do we want to lose another two and a half thousand lives, spend another 20 billion pounds, and spend another 20 years occupying the province? At one time, Walter Green had doubts similar to these. When my son was killed, I did call for the troops to be pulled out to Northern Ireland. Since then, I've had time to rethink. I've had a look round at what's happening here in Northern Ireland. I do not agree that the troops should be withdrawn just for the sake of taking them home. If they are withdrawn, I just feel that my son and everyone else that has died here have lost their lives for nothing. And uh, by taking the troops out just like that, would be given a, a victory to the IRA. Politicians who represent the moderate centre of Ulster politics have other reasons for opposing British withdrawal. How are you, Mr. Green? Very glad to meet you. Hello, Mr. Green. Nice to see you here. Here. John Hume is leader of the Social Democratic and Labour Party. The party represents most Catholics and rejects violence. Mr. Hume, what do you think would happen if the British troops were pulled out of Northern Ireland? Well, uh, well, if the British government promoted agreement between the different sections of the community here, the different sections of the people of this island, and that agreement was reached, uh, and then they left, and I don't, then, then, then that's one scenario which I think would be an acceptable scenario. But if they were to just pull out and, and leave us to it, then that's the worst possible scenario in my view. Uh, and that would leave us with a, a Cyprus-Lebanon-style situation because in the, there would be a vacuum, there would be no established authority. The vacuum will be filled. Each section of this community would take charge of the, sec of the territory. Uh, what would uh, the police force do? What would the UDR do? They would go back to the community from which they come. 95% of them come from the Protestant community. That's 20,000 armed and trained men. And there's the Catholic community, and, and they wouldn't have any of this. Uh, it, it, it's, it would be rather similar to what happened in Cyprus or the Lebanon. I've learned quite a bit about Northern Ireland. Talking to the different people that I have spoken to, I've had some of the questions answered that I wanted answering, and I've had a better insight as to what is taking place over here. My belief has been and always will be that tougher security measures will have to be taken. And I do believe that the troops should be reinforced. They should also be given the go-ahead to pursue known terrorists even if it means crossing the border into Southern Ireland and to arrest these people. I do believe that some form of internment should be reconsidered. In the present troubles in Northern Ireland, 410 British soldiers have been killed. And with every casualty, the pressure is on the government to take some dramatic countermeasure. Peter Bullock lost his son when a bus was bombed last month. So what sort of measures do you think the security forces should take against people found to be carrying guns? I think they should be shot. And further to that, I think that, uh, that the, the government should bring in um, a hanging for, for all terrorists. Do you think that might perhaps make martyrs of them? They'll be dead martyrs, won't they? The voices of the bereaved are likely to be powerful, if extreme. 
Mrs. Margaret Gavin's son, Andrew, was blown up in his Saracen armoured car in 1981. The IRA have a policy of shoot, kill, which includes the Irish police, the Irish army, and the British army, whether they're in Ireland or anywhere else in the world. They are a legitimate target. So I don't see why the IRA can't be a legitimate target for us or for the British Army. Do you think there should be a, a shoot-to-kill policy? I don't see why not. That's what the IRA practice. Mr Hume, I firmly believe that something should be done up here in Northern Ireland, a stepping up of security. I believe that it should be some form of internment for these people. I don't think we should forget that uh, if security measures could have solved this problem, they would have been solved long ago. Because I remember in the early 70s when internment was brought in, in the 18 months immediately after that, 650 people died. That's 10 times as many as have died in the past 12 months. 20,000 troops were brought onto the streets because they were needed on the streets. We have an awful lot of emergency legislation here. We have Prevention of Terror Terrorism Act, which uh, strengthen the normal process of the law in this part of the world for dealing with these problems. The problem in its essence derives from a deep division between people here, the mistrusts and prejudices of centuries which gave rise to that. If we lose the hearts and minds battle, which we've partially lost through things like Gibraltar, um, we will be seen to behave in a way that impartial observers and people involved inside the province will deem as just as unfair, just as unacceptable as the measures the terrorists use. If we shoot people who are unarmed, it is quite understandable that a Catholic will get up and say, well, if the British government shoot people who are unarmed, why the hell shouldn't the IRA? Some have urged that anyone caught carrying a gun should be shot on the spot. How do you feel about that? I think that would be a disaster. I think that would simply play into the hands of the IRA. I think it would be the best IRA recruitment policy the British government could possibly put forward. As Walter Green's tour went on, he heard from every side of the political spectrum, but continued to favour internment for suspected terrorists and tougher security. He stood firm on the central issue behind all the arguments. Talking to the majority of the people that I have spoke to, they believe Northern Ireland to be part of Great Britain. And you do too? Yes, I do, yes. Do you think it's worth continuing to use British troops in support of the idea that it's part of Great Britain? Yes, I do. During Walter Green's visit, as over the previous 19 years, the IRA continued to be active. A car bomb went off, a senior civil servant's home was destroyed, and a soldier was injured. Signs that the campaign to get Britain out was far from exhausted. Men like Vincent Kelly continue to believe that force could legitimately be used to get Britain out of Northern Ireland. Now, he's not going to give up his view, is he? No, he isn't. And you aren't going to give up yours, are you? No. So how do you see the future? There's got to be somewhere that the politicians can bring about, uh, in my terms, a ceasefire while they actually sit down and sort it out around a, a proper table. Get all the sides together. But there is nothing to sort out. It's either in the United Kingdom or it isn't. Well, the majority in Northern Ireland believe it to be part of the United Kingdom. And if a minority is going to take up arms and use bombs and guns, then that minority has got to be stopped. It looks like war for a long time, doesn't it? It does look as though it could go on for quite a long time. Four days ago, Walter Green came back to England, having at least touched on the political questions that he went to explore. There had also been a personal satisfaction. I really enjoyed the trip itself. I've been able to get some things sorted out in my mind. It seized my mind quite a bit after talking to the people I've seen in Northern Ireland, especially the, the Reverend Cromwell as regards my son and his five comrades' death. Maybe I'll be able to sleep a little bit better and generally feel better myself. <laughs>